Oh, good morning. Let's stand together and worship our Savior Jesus. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well. Thanks and sing. 
We rejoice because Jesus has conquered death, hell, the grave. He stands triumphant and victorious. And as the Apostle Paul said, rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Merciful and righteous, praise him, oh praise him, make a joyful My name is Ellis and I'm the senior pastor here at First Baptist Church Richardson. And I wanna thank you for joining us in worship today. I'm so glad that God has blessed you today through this worship service. At our church, we encourage every church member to read the Bible every day. In fact, we're doing it together through something called the Well Bible Reading Journey. And many people have come to me asking me, how can I better understand the Bible? As they read the Bible every day, they're telling me sometimes it's hard to understand. So I've put together this six session course on how to read the Bible for understanding. It's a very elementary course. If you've never taken any Bible course before, you can understand it. It's a very elementary course on how to read the Bible for understanding. If you would like that course, you can sign up for it by texting the word Bible to the number you see on the screen. Text the word Bible, B-I-B-L-E, to the number you see on the screen, and we'll be glad to send that six session course to you so you can read the Bible for better understanding. I know that God is gonna bless you as you serve Him, seek Him, and worship Him. God bless you. We're getting ready to sing a song, and it, it doesn't have a lot of lyrics to it, but the main ones are, the Lord God Almighty reigns. And we have a holy, holy God who is almighty and who we could not be in the presence of were it not for the Lamb. And that's what this song says, is holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, worthy is the Lamb. 
So as we pray, prepare your heart to sing that song. God, thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ, who not only gave his life for us, but he gives us living, victorious life. And in him, we can live and we can be in the presence of the Father and we can be victorious and we can share that love with the world around us. Teach us to love you well. Teach us to love people well. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing this song of praise. Alleluia. The word in this, it's the same word in every language. Alleluia. It means praise you, God. Let's lift our voices.
chapter 5. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. We worship the one who died for us.
Good morning, and thank you for worshiping with us this morning. We want to welcome you. All uh, those of you who are watching online, we're so thankful that you're joining us today for worship, and I pray that God has already blessed you as we have worshiped him. We're going to continue to worship him by going to God's word in Matthew chapter 26. It's one of the readings in the Well Bible Reading Journey this last week. If you're following along with us in the well, then you've already read this chapter and you're familiar with it. We're going to take a piece of it today and talk about discipleship. We're in a series of sermons this summer unpacking what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And this week we come to Matthew chapter 26, and I'll be reading the first 16 verses. So let's look together there, Matthew chapter 26, beginning with verse 1. This is what the Word of God says. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, As you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. While Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. <clears throat> Truly I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. When I first entered seminary uh, in 1989, I quickly discovered that there was a battle going on in the life of the Southern Baptist Convention. I had no idea before that that this was happening, but it didn't take long for me to realize that there had developed two different factions within the Southern Baptist Convention and they were fighting each other for control of the substantial assets of this massive convention. I was told through my seminary years that I would at some point need to choose which side I was going to be on. This went on for the first 10 years of my ministry and as a young pastor I even had uh, key leaders from both sides of this fight uh, come to me and to tell me that if, if I chose to join them, their side in the fight, that I would um, go far, <laughs> whatever that means. Uh, but the question that kept ringing in my ear during those early years of my ministry, the question that kept hounding me as I was being pressured to choose a side was this, how do I stay loyal to God? This is the driving question for the disciple of Jesus. This is the driving question of discipleship, period. How do I stay loyal? Not to any man, not to a denominational apparatus, not, not to an institution, not even to a particular church, but how do I stay loyal to God. This is the question that should be ringing in your ears as you develop as a disciple of Jesus Christ. This is the driving question. How do I stay loyal to, to God? So this morning we're in Matthew chapter 26, and in Matthew chapter 26, Matthew is taking us into the last week of Jesus's life. He is spending his days teaching and debating in the temple courts, and his evenings he retires to Bethany, a small village about two miles east of Jerusalem, where he's staying most likely in the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, the brother and two sisters. They were good friends of his. And he's hiding. He's hiding from the authorities. He knows that they're after him. He knows that they're plotting against him. Uh, he knows that his time is short. Uh, and he knows that very soon uh, he will be crucified. He knows all of this. He knows that he will be betrayed. 
and he knows that it will be Judas. Jesus knows. He knows it's Judas. He knows Judas. John, in his gospel, in this scene, tells us that Judas was actually the treasurer of the group and that he had been stealing money from the treasury. That would have been no surprise to Jesus. Jesus would have known that because he knew Judas. So this is, this is what's happening in the scene that comes to us. And, and in this scene here in Matthew chapter 26, the first 16 verses that we read, Matthew paints a stark and unsettling contrast between the true disciple of Jesus and the false disciple of Jesus. What, what Matthew is doing in these, these opening lines to this chapter, I want you to see, this last week of Jesus' life, he wants to paint two pictures side by side so that we can compare and contrast the picture of Mary, the, the, the woman who anointed Jesus, the devoted disciple of Jesus, compared to Judas, the betrayer, the false disciple of Jesus. And it is in that comparison, it's when we see the two side by side, that we catch a glimpse into what it means to be a true disciple of Jesus. So I want you to see that in the scripture passages that we read, there are actually three scenes in the part that we read. There, there's three movements, if you will, three quick scenes. In the very first scene, verses one to five, uh, Matthew tells us, he lets us know that the chief priests the elders, the high priest, and the religious elite are all conspiring to capture Jesus and to kill him. They want him dead. They don't want to do it at that moment because of the people. The people in Jerusalem, during Passover, the population of Jerusalem would swell to close to a million people. And the people loved Jesus. The people hung on his every word. The people adored him. And they were worried that uh, if they killed him, that the people would riot. So their, their thinking is that they'll wait till after Passover and then get him. But Judas will give them an opportunity to do it sooner than that. And so he lets us know this at the very beginning, these first five verses, because it sets the tension for the story. We know what's happening. Jesus knows what's happening. No one else knows. In the second scene, it moves to Bethany, and that's verses 6 to 13. And in that scene, it's the scene where Mary anoints Jesus with this expensive perfume. And the disciples complain about this. John, in his gospel, again, tells us that it was actually Judas who complained about this because Judas wanted the money for himself. Well, whatever the case, Jesus reprimands Judas for complaining, and he commends Mary, the woman who anointed him. He commends her for anointing him, and he says, she is anointing me for my burial. This is what she's doing. He, he had been telling them that he was going to go to Jerusalem. He had been telling them that he was going to die. He had been telling them that he was going to be crucified. But they didn't want to hear that. Sometimes we hear what we want to hear, and we ignore what we don't want to hear. And it seems that none of the disciples wanted to hear any of that. They didn't want to be any part of that plan. But it is Mary. She's the only one, it seems, who believed in the plan, who had the faith to say that if God wants to take Jesus away from us, then God must have his reasons. And so she, she wants to be a part of the plan. She wants to help Jesus. And the only way she knows how to help him, based on the plan that he has laid out, the only way she can help him is to anoint him for his burial. See, that's what faith looks like. And whenever Judas, remember the, the portrait of the false disciple, whenever Judas sees the real faith of Mary, when he sees the real thing, that's when he throws his hands up in the air and he leaves. He has to get out of there. He can't take it. He can't handle it. He, he gives up on Jesus. He gives up on Jesus as Messiah. He gives up on God's plan. In so doing, he kind of gives up on God, and he goes, and for 30 pieces of silver, 30 pieces of silver, he betrays, agrees to betray Jesus. So what are some of the things that we learn then from this contrast between Mary and Judas in this scene? Well, the first is that the true disciple must stay focused on Jesus. That was Mary's entire focus was Jesus. Judas is thinking about himself, his agenda, his plan, his vision for what Messiah is. And Judas looks at Jesus and says, you have been a complete disappointment to me. 
Do you see where the emphasis is? Jesus had become a disappointment to Judas because he wasn't being the kind of Messiah that Judas wanted for his life. But Mary is completely focused on Jesus. She anoints him for his burial. She's focused on him. By the way, we believe this is the same Mary that earlier in the gospel story is sitting at Jesus' feet, learning from him. She is sitting in the position of a disciple, learning from Jesus. And Martha, her sister, comes into the room and says, tell Mary to get with me in the kitchen where she belongs. I need help. And Jesus says to Martha, Martha, you're worried about a lot of things. In other words, your focus is scattered. But Mary has chosen the best thing the right thing. She's focused on Jesus, and Jesus says, I'm not going to take that away from her. This was Mary. She is focused on Jesus, and if you're going to stay faithful to God and loyal to God as a disciple of Jesus Christ, and you have to remember that Jesus is at the center of everything. Jesus is everything. Jesus is the one we adore. Jesus is the one we serve. Jesus is the one we worship, and there is no other but Jesus. You see, this is the problem that most out there have with Jesus. It's not his teachings. What did Jesus teach? He taught to love each other, to love God. Unconditional love, grace, forgiveness, healing, wholeness. Who could be against these things? People are not against the things Jesus teaches. The problem they have with Jesus is not what he taught. The problem they have with Jesus is that Jesus said, I am the one and only true son of God. There is no other way but me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And the world looks at that and says, well, that's exclusive. I, the world wants options, but Jesus doesn't give them options. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That's not hard to understand. You don't have to do a lot of biblical interpretive gymnastics to figure it out. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. When the branches are cut off from the vine, they die. They die. That's pretty simple to understand, that Jesus is our focus. Jesus is everything, and without him, we die. Without Jesus, there is no Christianity. There is no faith. There is no heaven. Without Jesus, Jesus is the one who gives it all to us. I remember when I was in seminary, I read an article out of the Houston Chronicle, actually. I no longer have the article. I couldn't find it, but it's, it's a true story. A, a man who was a, a skydiving photographer, he would jump out of planes with his cameras and film these skydiving teams who would do all kinds of tricks in the sky. You've seen them, and you've seen the pictures. Well, how do they get those pictures? Well, someone jumps out with them, and is filming it. And so this is a man. It's, this is what he did. He had done it for years and years and years. And he was filming a, a world-renowned acrobatic skydiving team. He was very excited about it. He had put on all of his camera equipment, which is very heavy. He got all ready. He was super excited. He jumps out of the airplane, and he forgot his parachute. He, a true story, he forgot the parachute. And I'm thinking, how can you forget the parachute? I mean, I, 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 how, if I were jumping out of an airplane, by the way, I will never jump out of an airplane. But if I were going to, I would be checking and double checking that parachute, man. I would be clinging to that parachute. That parachute is my salvation once I jump out of that airplane. How did he forget? Well, he had done it for so many times. It had become second nature to him. It, he was so excited. He had all the other equipment. He had everything he needed except the one thing that he needed the most. What I want you to see is that, is that trying to do this life, and especially this Christian stuff, without Jesus at the center, without Jesus being your everything, is like jumping out of an airplane without a parachute. It never ends well. It never ends well when you don't have Jesus as your focus. That's the first thing we see in Mary. She, she is focused, laser focused on Jesus. The second thing is that you give Jesus your very best. The complaint against Mary was that she spent too much money on Jesus. She wasted money on Jesus. She, she was too extravagant. She was over the top. What, what was going through her mind when she did this? What was she thinking when she broke that jar on Jesus and anointed him with that very expensive oil? Je Jesus says, what does he say about her? He says, she's going to be remembered for this. He says in verse 13, he says that wherever this gospel will be preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of, of for a memorial of her. What does that mean? 
What is Jesus trying to say? John in his gospel tells us that what she poured on him was something called spikenard. It's a very expensive and fairly rare uh, essential oil taken from a, a, a flowering plant from the honeysuckle family uh, that was found in the Himalayans of Nepal uh, and uh, India and China. So it had to be imported for them to get it, and it was very ex- expensive. And so this is what she, this is what she pours on him uh, in, that, in that moment. It was, it was used for many different reasons. It was burned as incense in the temple so that this spikenard was closely associated with the worship practices of the Hebrew people. It was used sometimes for medicinal purposes. Uh, And of course, because of the strong, pungent, and musky smell, it was used to prepare bodies for, for burial. And Jesus says that's what she's doing. An entire pint of this stuff, which is what John says it was, an entire pint of this stuff would have filled that entire house with the odor for days and probably even weeks afterwards. Think about that. Weeks later, they're still smelling that smell. Judas's complaint was that it was worth one year's worth of wages. Think about that. How much do you make in one year? That's how much that alabaster jar of ointment costs. A full year's worth of wages. And when that's pointed out to Jesus, look, Jesus, look at this waste. We could have used it for the poor. It's it's wasting money. And when that's pointed out to Jesus, Jesus just shrugs and says she did the right thing. In fact, not only did she do the right thing, but this thing that she just did is so inextricably tied to the gospel message that from this day forward, wherever in the world the gospel is preached, this woman will be remembered because this act is intrinsically, inextricably tied to the gospel message. So why is that? Why? Well, think about it. Think about the picture she's painting with that act. Mary is painting a picture of the devoted disciple and the, paint, the picture of this costly, costly grace it is a picture of the extravagant, unconditional, over-the-top, quixotic love and grace of God. It's a picture, in other words, of the gospel message. It's a picture of this, this unconditional love that throws everything away for the other person. This unconditional love, the kind of love that so engulfs you, so surrounds you, that you, you have to feel it. You can't help but feel it because you recognize how, how costly it is and you recognize how rare it is. Think about it, this grace, this love that will spend a year's worth of wages, throw it away on you. Think about that. Let's just say you have a year's worth of wages, whatever it is you make in a year. Put that number down and you have that set aside in your savings. You've been saving 10% a year for the last 10 years. And after 10 years, you finally have in your savings a year's worth of your salary set aside and and you're going to just give it away to one person. You're just going to throw it away on one person. Make the list. Who are the people on that list? Who are the people that you would take a year's worth of wages and just give it away to them? Go ahead and make the list. It shouldn't take you very long because if you're anything like me, it's a pretty short list. It's a short list. I mean, really, the people that you're going to give this to, do you want to do you want to see God's list of the people he would do that for? The whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He gave away his heart for us. You see, it's, that's God's list, the whole world. That's the unconditional, completely engulfing, powerful, life-changing love and grace of God. I was watching recently the story of Ryan Swaglar, and I think I butchered that name, but he's from South Africa, and he was uh, uh, in South Africa one of the, the, the founders and, and uh, one of the priests of the Satanic Church in South Africa, uh, and had preached the Satanism for a number of years, uh, had actually won thousands to this Satanic Church. Um, he was, had a podcast. He was doing all kinds of things to promote Satanism in South Africa. And then one day he met 
He met Jesus through some Christians. He, he, came, he came right into this engulfing, unconditional, powerful, life-changing love of Jesus. I want you to hear just a clip uh, from his testimony. Just listen carefully to this. Donnie and Adele Frey. I don't know. I can't. Words cannot express what you have done for me. Adele sent me a message over this weekend and, and she said, but, you know, I've, just, I've done such a simple thing. I've, I've just showed you love. People means that to show someone love is everything. It's not a simple thing. You have showed me everything. You've showed me the love of Christ. I've seen it in you. So, Donnie and Adele, Thank you so much for that. And you've showed me unconditional love in a time where I was a monster, an ugly person, where I took people like you on. You showed me unconditional love. So thank you for that. In the middle of May last, it's about yeah, two months ago, I did my last interview for the South African Satanic Church, not knowing that that would be my last radio interview that I'm doing. I did this interview, and after the interview, this lady came to me. And in this interview, I said, I don't believe in Jesus. And I don't believe that Jesus Christ exists, because I didn't. And she came to me after the interview, after I said that. And she hugged me and she held me in a way that I've never been loved. That's all she did. She didn't say anything. She just said, it's nice to finally meet you in person. And she just hugged me and she held me. And a week later, uh, through WhatsApp, through a status, I saw this woman is a Christian. I couldn't believe it because I've never had a Christian do that. I've never had, I've never experienced A Christian showing that much love and acceptance unconditionally. After I've said the things I've said, she did that. And it stayed with me. I, I just like, I said, oh, okay, cool. She's a Christian, whatever. In the occult, there is certain rituals that you do to ascend to the top of a pyramid. And you can only do a certain amount at a time. And I had to do a ritual by myself to see what is the next step? How do I get more, more power, more influence? And I did this ritual and I opened myself up. And Jesus appeared. And I was extremely cocky. And I said, whatever. If you are Jesus, you need to prove it. And he flooded me with the most beautiful love and energy. And I recognized it immediately because that woman at the radio station showed it to me. That's how I recognized the love of Christ. Because four people 
for Christians showed it. That's the power of the gospel message. That's the power of this all-encompassing, engulfing, unconditional grace and love of God. When you give God your very best, it changes lives. That's the second thing we see. And then the third thing, the third thing we see about this faithful disciple, loyal disciple, is that Mary is living at the center of God's plan, and Judas is not. She, she's the only one in the room, it seems, who's all in on the plan. The plan, and the plan was no secret. Jesus had not kept the plan a secret. Jesus had been telling them for at least a year, he had been telling them repeatedly, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be handed over to evil men, they're going to crucify me, I'm going to die, I'm going to be buried, and on the third day I will rise again. That's the plan, and it was not a secret plan. Jesus had shared it with all of his disciples, but the only one it seems who really believed in the plan, who was all in on the plan, who was ready to join Jesus in the plan, it seems to be Mary. She is the little girl who shows up at the country church prayer meeting where they're praying for rain and this little girl shows up with an umbrella. She's the only one who shows up with an umbrella, right? She's the only one who's all in and really believes this thing is going to happen. Mary has joined Jesus in his plan. Judas is not. Jud Judas is saying, Jesus' plan is not his plan. Jud Judas's plan. Judas had his vision. He had his dreams. He had his desires. He had the things that he believed Messiah was supposed to do. And Jesus was a disappointment to him because Jesus wasn't doing what he wanted Jesus to do. Have you ever been there where God is not doing what you want God to do? God is not getting on board with the plans you have for your life, for the vision you have for your life, for the dreams that you have for your life. And God is not joining in you in that this is where Judas was and Judas gives up on God he turns away from God in that moment right we know we know for instance that that Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver but listen all the other disciples betrayed him as well they all ran none of them stayed with him through the trial the crucifixion they were hiding Peter denied Jesus three times before the cock crowed. They all betrayed him in one way or another. So what was the difference? Because Judas betrays him and Judas goes out and hangs himself. Right? He commits suicide. What's the difference? The difference is that Judas gave up on God. Judas gave up on God's plan for his life. Judas gave up on Jesus. But not Mary. Mary. She is the one who stays inside the perfect will of God. Priscilla and I, a couple of weeks ago, um, watched the movie. I'd been wanting to watch it for a while. Hadn't had a chance to watch it. It's live streaming now, I think, on Amazon Prime. And we watched the movie uh, called Father Stew. It's a, it's a good movie. I, I recommend it. Uh, it's a story of Stuart Long, who was this boxer and kind of reprobate. He was in and out of trouble with the law. He had had a, a very difficult childhood, uh, dysfunctional family, um, he had alcohol, drugs, um, the whole thing. He went out to California eventually. He gets hurt, can't box anymore, goes out to California to, uh, to become an actor. That doesn't work out predictably. Uh, and then he meets this woman who's a Christian. She happens to be a Catholic Christian. And it, it slowly... Uh, changes his life. Uh, I want you to watch this just really brief clip um, kind of explaining what happens with him. Father Stu is the story of Father Stuart Long, who was a boxer from Helena, Montana. He had lived a life basically without any faith. That ain't got time for me, I ain't got time for him. But Stu fell in love with this incredible woman. Hey! And he had no idea hey! that she was really committed to doing God's work and serving God in the church. I can't date someone who isn't baptized. So when he met her, he was just telling her whatever she wanted to hear. I thought you was going to say Hispanic. Where's the water? I'll do it now. But God puts people in your life for a reason. Cindy brought him back to health. She was pretty much responsible for getting him in the church. After the motorcycle accident, you know, he went in and prepared to become Catholic. He was willing to open up to something bigger than himself. And what the church needs is somebody who's going to fight for God. That's me. And he knows 
It's not about him. It's about his work and his commitment and dedication and service to God. In his youth, I think he struggled with pride. And as he matured and became a faithful person, his pride converted to confidence. He just led so naturally and so easily. We've all been wrong, and we've all done some wrong. But he came to forgive us. That's what he wanted to do, and that's where he found his purpose. What happened with Stuart Long is that he, he has this epiphany. He discovers the real plan God has for his life. He discovers the reason God created him. And as soon as he discovers that, this horrible thing happens to him, this, this rare disease that starts to cripple him and will eventually kill him. And so he understandably asks, why? This was not his plan. It was God's plan. And it's when you see when you see yourself inside of God's plan, see, there's no, there's no better place to be. There's no more fulfilling place to be. She was at the center of God's plan for her life. And then finally, the last thing, the last thing about this faithful disciple is that you remember who you are in Jesus Christ. Mary had this sense somehow of who she was in Jesus. She was a woman in a room full of men. She was an outcast. It's interesting to see how the different uh, gospel writers report her. Uh, Luke calls her a sinful woman. Uh, uh, I believe Mark identifies her as Mary. Um, she, in Matthew, she's just a woman. She's not, she's not even given a name. You see, it's, she's, she's kind of on the margin. She's, she, she's in the house of a man called Simon the leper, who maybe may have been Lazarus, but Simon the leper, he was someone who, was, who, had, been, who had been tagged with this kind of outcast title, a leper. That they were not exactly dining with the upper crust of religious society in Jerusalem. In fact, in certain religious circles in Jerusalem, she would have been considered a harlot just for touching Jesus in public. Just for doing what she did with Jesus, she would have been considered a sinful woman. It would have been a scandalous thing for many in Jerusalem to watch this happen. Right there in a room full of men, this woman enters and she anoints Jesus. She touches him and she's not even his wife. This would have been scandalous. They were scandalized by this. It's always interesting to me to see how religious people are scandalized by other people's sins, not by their sins. Their sins don't scandalize them at all. It's always other people's sins that scandalize them. That, that, that oftentimes the religious, religious people are scandalized by the sins of those outside of religion. It's interesting to me because Jesus never was. He was not scandalized by this. The sinners didn't seem to bother Jesus at all. In fact, he, he seemed more comfortable around sinners. He was always talking to them. He was dining with them. He fellowshiped with them. He, the biggest accusation that his enemies had against him is that he partied too much with these sinful, these sinful people. Jesus was never scandalized by people's, by people's sins, you understand. He, he never hated the sinner that's way, that way. She knows who she is. She knows her place in society. And yet there's something about Jesus that draws her in and makes her think that she can actually do this thing. There's something about Jesus that gives her permission, even a woman in a room full of men, even a woman who's considered an outcast and a marginalized person, there's something about Jesus that makes her think that she can touch him and she can anoint him. There's something about Jesus that makes her a woman feel like she can be a part of the Jesus story. And don't miss this, Jesus affirms that when he says, wherever from this point forward, wherever in the world the gospel is preached, don't miss this part. He says, this woman will be remembered. A woman in a room full of men. This woman will be remembered for what she has done. You see? And it's after that that Judas throws his hands in the air and says, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I can't follow Jesus anymore. I can't believe in Jesus anymore. When he sees the real faith of Mary, he is scandalized by that. And he leaves. And he goes to the chief priest to betray Jesus. He gave up on Jesus. He never fully understood Jesus. Judas was following his own political agenda. 
Judas was following some political agenda, and he goes out eventually and kills himself, I believe, because he realizes that he has been following all the wrong things. I think at the end of his life, he realizes that when you follow some political agenda instead of Jesus, that it ends with nothing, that it's empty. Following a political agenda instead of following Jesus never ends well for you. It ends with an empty life. And that's why Judas goes out and kills himself. And Peter, for instance, doesn't. Because Peter never stopped giving up on God. Peter never stopped giving up on Jesus. Peter never stopped believing that God and Jesus and their infinite wisdom and love could do something with him, could do something with his sin, could do something with his failures, could turn him around. He never stopped believing in that. You see, so you see that in Mary. She understood who she was. You must understand who Jesus is, who you are in Christ. You are a child of God, a son and a daughter of God of the king that's who you are so you understand who jesus is who you are in jesus christ and once you understand that you never ever forget it and you never ever give up on the idea that you belong to jesus that's how you stay loyal to god to the very end let's pray Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace and your love. We thank you for all the things that you give to us, all the things you are to us. Oh, Jesus, you are our Lord and our Savior, our King, our Master. You are the one who leads us every day. We lift you up and praise you and honor you. And we pray that you would bless us now as we commit ourselves to being your followers true disciples of Jesus Christ. Help us to stay loyal to you and to God the rest of our days. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us in worship today. I pray that God has blessed you in a special way, and I can't wait to see you again next Sunday.